Welcome back to the Fitness, Wellness, and Longevity Podcast. I'm Sean LaFlock, and today's guest was Michael Herbert. Michael Herbert, I've known for almost a decade now, and he's been in the recovery and addiction treatment for drug addiction for over 25 years now. He's worked with celebrities, professionals, families in addiction and recovery. Michael is also an avid CrossFitter who I've been training for almost a decade now. Uh, Michael has his own website where you can get more information is recoveryguide.net to learn more about his philosophies and life coaching. Guys, if you like this podcast, please subscribe, rate, and review, and enjoy today's podcast with Michael Herbert. I'm here with Michael Herbert. Uh, Michael, um, can you give us like a two-second description of what it is that you do for a living? <laughs> Okay, what it is that I do for a living. I'm an, I'm an addiction counselor, um, a coach. I work with families that uh, have a loved one with an addiction problem. I do interventions, and I do a process called structured family recovery, where I work with families to engage them in a recovery process. So uh, how long have you been um, working in recovery, and uh, to what capacity have you been doing this current endeavor? So I've been working in the field of addiction since 1991. So I guess that's about 28, 29 years. Um, and I've worked in all facets of, um, of treatment. I've worked inpatient, outpatient, detox, residential, community-based. Um, you know, I do didactic lectures. I do group therapy. I've done gestalt therapy. Um, all different kinds. I think over the last 10 years, I've focused more on the family as a unit versus the individual with a drug or alcohol problem because I just find it to be more effective working with the family and the person with the addiction problem is a part of the family, so they're included in this, That rather than working with people in isolation. So... Where I come in, in in terms of like my frame of reference and how I frame things is how do I create um, awareness? How do I learn from someone in your field uh, as it pertains perhaps to my own profession and my own career? So um, have you gotten to work with um, uh, athletes in recovery thus far? I've worked with athletes, I've worked with business people, I've worked with entertainment people, I've worked with people on welfare, I've worked with uh, people in their 80s. Um, I don't work with uh, teenagers or adolescents. That's not my, um, that's not my forte, nor do I have the patience. <laughs> Had you ever uh, been someone who works with more of adolescents and teens and that kind of thing? No, no. I've, I worked at a... Um, and when I was first doing an internship, I worked on an adolescent unit where people were uh, 13 to 17. And um, I did that for about a year, and that's the last that I've done with that. So I, I, I just don't think my strength is working with uh, teenagers or even 18 and 19-year-olds. It's just not where I don't think I'm, I'm strong at that. So you had mentioned that uh, the many different types of individuals and clients that you work with. So uh, would you say that um, you know addiction doesn't really care about what you do for a living? No, it, do it doesn't care what you do for a living. Um, it doesn't care about your race, your age. It's just a destructive process. And um, so, yeah, I mean, I know plenty of people with a lot of money that have the same problems as people with, with less money, you, you know, so addiction doesn't care. Yeah. So, um, you know, going back to individuals in fitness, um, you know, do, do you find that there is somewhat of an addictive tendency for even, um, you know, athletes or former athletes or individuals to become attached to, uh, training, working out, you know, the way it feels, that kind of thing? Well, I, I, I do, because there is a good feeling that you get when you work out. So most people would want more of that. Um, and I would imagine that there's a certain population within that population that takes it too far. And uh, 
is there any way that you can kind of uh, see on the surface of, and I guess this goes to a more general idea of what addiction is, is how can you kind of tell relatively objectively of something that's a healthy benefit to your life versus something that starts to become an addiction? Well, well, I think when you when you look at a balance, because addiction is off balance, it's it's way more than what w- someone would consider normal. This preoccupation or engagement in this one thing is 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 just over the top. So it gets in the way of eating, sleeping, family, um, and the list goes on. And we can also look at people who might be considered I don't know that it's a medical term, but workaholics that people who are just imbalanced around their work, and it's not because they have to work, other than the fact that they have to work because it's addiction. It's not because they're required to do more, they almost can't stop themselves. So now that we've kind of identified what those, you know, what it looks like, what is usually the first step in terms of intervention for people? Well, I I mean, there has to be an awareness um, that a person gets. And for some people, it's, it, it, it really is something that gets chipped away. Mm-hmm. So you got a problem. Somebody mentions you have a problem. You say you don't have a problem. Something else happens. Somebody else mentions it. You know, there's a, a series of events, I think, for some people that lead them to getting help. It's not like somebody tells you one day, you know, you got a problem, you got to fix it right now, and boom, the light goes off and I'm going to go fix it. No, because denial sets in and says, number one, I don't need help. What are you telling me? I'm a loser that, you know, I need to go somewhere to get help. So most people will try to defend what they're doing and figure it out on their own without help before getting it. Mm-hmm. And uh, kind of going back to uh, the use of denial, um, do you find that that's actually something that people use to not change? Uh, absolutely. Yeah. It, I mean, denial is a psychological mechanism used to protect us from an unacceptable reality. So I love that uh, description, by the way. <laughs> I, um, so you look at people with addiction problems, addicts and alcoholics, and they tend to be a stigmatized group. So when I think about an addict or an alcoholic, you think about the bum on the street, a thief, a liar, jail, uh, diseases, and the list goes on of negative, right? Why would I admit that I'm all of that if I have a job? So I'm gonna deny that because the stigma prevents me from telling the truth. Because most people with addiction problems have jobs, live in society, and blend in. The, the, the people on the streets are usually there due to mental illness that doesn't allow them to get off the streets. So when you look at them, you say, oh, those are junkies, those are drug, those are really bad people. Um, but the majority, in my experience, of people with addiction problems are working people. You know, they just fit in to everybody else. So if they don't look like what society says a drug addict is, that person isn't going to admit to having a problem. When I get like that, then I'll get help. (laughs) So uh, I guess it goes now to what your role is in this and um, as obviously a coach and an interventionist is, um, you know, probably when you get to sit in in front of somebody, they've reached a point where they go, I've tried it to figure it out myself, Mm -hmm. but it hasn't worked just yet. Is that pretty accurate? Or is there uh, some families that are involved also that say, hey, we need you to to kind of come in and maybe, you know, slap sense into people or... or Well, you know, on some level, the family needs just as much help as a person with the addiction problem because they fuel the addiction through their enabling. So they enable what we call the disease of addiction, and they're not enabling the recovery process. Mm -hmm. So most family members would deny the fact that they need help. What they want to do is say, oh, no, my wife, husband, son, daughter needs help. Can you fix them? Well, what I've learned in working with people 
is if I can help the family get better, it actually forces the person with the addiction problem to get better. Mm. So treating the family first is probably a better way to go, even though that individual's in crisis. So yeah, if they're in true crisis, you got to deal with the crisis. Send them to the hospital or, or detox or something like that. But if you're not engaging the family fully in this process, your work's going to be a lot harder. Is this a broadly accepted way of intervention or is this something that's happened in more recent times? Because, you know, this isn't something that I've, you know, I've, um, I come from a family of addicts and, you know, when my family members would be in recovery, um, they would invite you to sessions and stuff like that. But there wasn't such a responsibility on the part of the family to change. Is this something that's um, more recent? In, in Well, I don't, I don't know about more recent. Mm-hmm. But from, from, I got to tell you, AA itself started by family members, mm-hmm. not by alcoholics. So it was the wives of oh, wow. who got that thing going. Um, I think, you know, many times, you know, families and individuals are told family works their program, the addict or alcoholic works their program. And um, that's not working. That if we bring families together, including the person with the addiction problem, it works much better. But engaging, because the family is experienced what I call secondhand drinking and drugging. And secondhand drinking and drugging is the ill effects of addiction that the family experiences, which are almost exactly the same thing the addict or the alcoholic experiences. The difference is the addict or the alcoholic gets help and the family member doesn't. So the addict has 20 years of active addiction. The family has 20 years of dealing with active addiction. And the addict goes away for 30, 60, 90 days, and the family gets uh, a phone call a week or a three-day family program. That is not sufficient for the trauma that they've gone through. And oftentimes, if the family isn't um, addressed and gotten help, they actually relapse and support the relapse of the person with the addiction problem without even knowing it through their loving behavior. So do families have a form of denial as well? Absolutely. Absolutely. Their denial is, I don't have the problem. Oh, it's him. They, He's the one with the problem. addiction. We're fine. Yeah. So what you're also saying is inherently that... Uh, so so let's... Let, He's got the problem, not me, Mm -hmm. okay? You've spent $150,000 on these failed attempts. Who spends $150,000 for something that doesn't work, right? And so (laughs) they- the next time it will, Michael. The the next time it will, and that's what the addict is saying. The next time, insanity is repeating the same behaviors and expecting different results. So writing a check for somebody to get better isn't, necessarily going to help them get better unless you're invested in the process. That also brings a question to my mind of, um, do you think those who have been seen as successful in the eyes of society have more resistance to this process than let's say others who are like, listen, like, you know, we don't have much, we need to change. Do you think sometimes that pressure to like, uh, and, and admittance that they don't have the answers because listen, like, you know, we, we come across people who seem like they have all the answers. They have the, you know, the, the six figure bank account, they drive the fancy car, they do everything the right way. And then they come up in, into front of something like addiction and they throw money at it and it doesn't seem to change. Well, it's like throwing money at diabetes. I mean, it's throwing money at heart disease. It's not going to change unless the person changes mm-hmm. and takes action. So you can't write a check to fix something like addiction. So you have to take some action, just like with diabetes. You got to take action, asthma, heart disease, cancer. It all needs to be, um, you know, worked on. You know, you know, the interesting thing about cancer is it's so science, science has taken over. So the science of cancer has helped lower the stigma around it. And people are able to talk more openly about cancer, getting help, and supporting each other. Years ago, people were shamed to talk about cancer. 
Now things have changed. There's races about it. You hear about cancer all the time. It really is commonplace. But addiction is one of the things that people keep as a secret. And we've got to um, show that recovery works. We've got to show the science around it. And we've got to help people understand that this is a disease that um, can be treated effectively. Now, obviously, bringing the family in, into the equation is a huge step uh, that many people have no idea and, and uh, probably wouldn't even think about. But um, are we saying that addiction is more of an environmental issue in terms of, uh, you know, like the, uh, is it a genetic thing or is it more of an environmental thing, how you're raised? Are you saying that there, the factors involved are much more environmental than they are I just was born this way. Well, I think the precursor, precursor to addiction could be you come from a culture that there's heavy use. Use before the age of 15. Untreated mental illness, untreated trauma, and genetics. So those are the five main, you know, precursors to addiction. Um, and there are some, you know, some people would add some other things. You know, the, the interesting thing about trauma is trauma doesn't always have to be physical or sexual abuse. It could be the trauma of um, divorce. It, there, there's lots of things that go on um, in families that um, trigger this thing called addiction because what people are trying to do is deal with, on some level, medicate their problems. So they earnestly are trying to help themselves with alcohol, marijuana, cocaine to deal with something. And it just goes horribly wrong. Yeah. I've actually heard, um, Russell Brand be quoted as saying, uh, when he first got into recovery, uh, his first therapist, cause he felt this shame around, you know, taking drugs. He was a uh, crack addict and a heroin addict. And, and she goes, thank God you found that because you'd be dead without it. <laughs> and so, so, so in a sense, uh, turning toward these addictions, whether they are, like we said, uh, drug addictions, they could be workaholics, they could be all these other things. Basically, what you're trying to do is you're trying to mask something that's happening and cope with it. Is, is that correct? Well, I, I, I think some people are, you know, so it could be issues of self-esteem. Um, if out of curiosity, I start smoking marijuana or drinking because I notice people who do seem happy and they're having a great time. Why not try it, right? So I try it and it makes me laugh. I have fun. But I also realize when I'm really pissed off, smoking a joint eases some of that. When I'm feeling sad, you know, having a drink might make me feel better. When I'm feeling great, Doing a bump or a line of cocaine, I'm going to feel even better. What I'm learn, what I'm learn, what I'm not learning is how to deal with situations like other people do. I am utilizing now a chemical to manage my emotions and my feelings, and of course, this is progressive. So I start using more and more, and I cope less and less. So I don't learn the lessons that the other kids learn about playing fair and you know being sad and and working through it and talking it through i just go smoke a joint you know so now i'm 47 years old <laughs> and why does everybody say michael acts like a big baby you know he's always upset he he doesn't he doesn't accept criticism well you know he's got all of these problems well because i didn't learn stuff when i was younger so would you say that in healthy families, this is something that is inherently shared and passed down from generation to the generation, this, this ability to accept what is, process what is, and grow from what is? Well, I, I mean, in an ideal family, I guess the communication is consistent and open um, but I don't work with people like that. I work with people, <laughs> who, people who, who the, um, the communication is off. And there's this phenomena called, um, they call it ACOA, which is Adult Children of Alcoholics. And there are certain rules in those families. Don't talk, don't trust, and don't feel. And those are passed on um, to the children. So what's said in our house stays in our house. Stop crying, I'll give you something to cry about. And you can't trust anybody. So don't trust people. Those people come from families 
where there's alcoholism or addiction, but we're seeing some of the same stuff in families where there's um, disease or there's mental illness or somehow there's a disrupt disruption in the family system and people begin to start coping differently. So you would say that, uh, you know, addiction is one of the symptoms, not the causes. That's what I would say, right. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, the thing that comes to mind also as we're, we're having this conversation is um, potentially societal, um, you know, hurdles that people have to undergo because especially in Western society, the United States, you know, once you get past the age of three nowadays, you're not spending most of your time with your family. You're spending your time outside of the household, whether it's in pre-K, school, you know, high school, college, et cetera. Your uh, determinants of who you are are now predominantly your peers. How does that influence not only the addict, but us in general? Well, I mean, if you're being influenced by your peers, what do your peers know? They don't, they don't, they, they're, they're really limited in what they know. And um, so I relied on my peers for advice around drugs, sex, life, and it was way off, you know? Um, and so I was misdirected by my, tier, my peers. <laughs> and then I joined the military with a bunch of people who had been misdirected. So now I've got another group of peers who are a little bit off, you know, um, who have a higher rate of addiction. So now I'm in this group who, who's constantly doing these things that aren't really helpful. And this doesn't seem like it is an uncommon uh, occurrence. And, and let, let me tell you, let me tell you. And I said I joined the military. Yeah. I joined the military and found that group in the military. Not to say that all of the military, it's I'm drawn right, to a yeah, certain right. group of people. My world in addiction, for me, just got small because I just gravitated to people who were like me and who did not um, tell me that, Michael, you're doing a little too much. I want people, I don't want somebody to, I don't want a buzzkill. I, you know, I want to, you know, when I'm getting high or when I was getting high, it was about I wanted to stay there. So I didn't want anybody to ruin that for me. So I only hung out with people who did what I did. And I also then assumed that everybody did what I did. I just, who doesn't do this? And um, so I was proven wrong over time. So if, if you're looking at yourself right now and you're looking for um, balance in your life, um, you know, you've described a bunch of things in terms of the people who you hang out with, your ability to um, cope with what life gives you. If you're looking at those things right now, and maybe it's not just drugs, it's other areas of your life, exercise, work, um, you know, um, self-deprecation, any addictions that we have, um, would you say it's safe to say that if, you know, looking at those things, objectively you go, wait a second, I'm surrounding myself with the same people as I because it gives me something. I'm unable to cope with what life is giving me and I naturally revert to those people or those habits. Would you you know, agree or at least kind of uh, cater to the idea that those are all presenting symptoms of addiction meaning that there's some underlying cause and problem to this? Well, well I think you know, as you're saying that, I'm, I'm thinking about self-esteem. Even in working in the field of addiction, I gravitated to those people who worked hard, worked long hours, and led an unbalanced life, even though we were teaching people to have a balanced life. So my, although I, I felt like I did great at what I did, and um, anybody would tell me that I did a great job, my life was unbalanced. And it took me a while to learn that, yeah, you know, so I'm, I'm working with these people that have their own set of issues, you know, and we're helping people that have a lot of other issues. I needed to move away from that. So at some point, I finally figured out that working wasn't going to raise my self-esteem. This whole idea 
uh, you know, hard work pays. Well, hard work sometimes kills. And I needed to move away from that and find a balance. And it took me probably 20 years, 20 years to figure out why am I killing myself for this employer who basically doesn't give a shit about me and is more concerned about the product of what I could offer. So I allowed people to empty me from all of, I had some good stuff and I was by employers taken advantage of, they took all of my stuff and profited from it. Um, over time I realized that that wasn't good for me and I had to make a decision, am I gonna continue to kill myself for somebody else or am I going to live? Do you think that that is part of the, the, the cause of that is underlyingly the source of your, like, like you said, self-esteem and that kind of thing, right? This is all a part, you know, of, of the growth process for me. Yes. My recovery was I start to recover in other ways. It's not about recovering just from the use of drugs. My thinking is different. So I was raised... Um, to you know, get a job, hold your job, work there for 20 years and get a pension. Well, that ain't the life that I wanna live. I want some adventure, I want some excitement, I wanna spend my money. You know, I don't wanna hold on to it until I retire. You know, where, you know, I mean, saving money is, is good too. Um, but I really wanna live my life. So when I gave up, well actually, I got fired from a job a job that I had for 14 years, um, and they fired me one day, and I sat down in the office with the boss, and two minutes later, I was packing my office. I had been there for 14 years. So I realized that they, they didn't give a shit about me, you know, um, and I didn't get fired for, you know, stealing or showing up late or anything like that. It was more of a personality thing. Um, the nice thing was two days later, I got the same salary from somebody else and I was working again. But in that second job, I realized, do I really want to do this? Do I want to do a repeat of what I had done for 14 years? And I decided I didn't want to do that. So with that job, I told the guy, listen, you got me here from nine to five. I'm done everything I need to do at two o'clock. And now I'm just waiting around till five. I want to save you some money and I want to give me some time. So how about I work for you for six hours a week? And um, we worked out a deal. I worked with them for six hours a week. You know, I got paid what I was supposed to get for six hours a week. And then I did some other things that I wanted to do. And I worked the way that I wanted to work. And that's what's been working for me for probably the last six or seven years that I'm doing my thing and I feel better about it. What was your, I mean, obviously you got fired from a job, but what was your aha moment to say, wait a second, I have the ability to change the course of what I do? Well, when I got fired from the job, I wanted to be angry over it. But I said, this is a relief. Thank God this guy fired me because I couldn't quit because they were, at that time, I thought they were paying me so much. So how do you quit a job? I had the golden handcuffs on. Yes. And so I realized, um, even though I, I still kind of resent the guy for doing it, the way he did it, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, it was really the best thing that could have happened for me because it really opened the doors for me to express my talents and my abilities um, without being, uh, without the man, so to speak, over me, dictating what I could do and what I couldn't do. It's, it's, I gotta tell you, it is very restrictive, at least how I see it, when there's someone in a position over you. Now, we don't all have the luxury of doing our own thing, but I gotta tell you, there is so much freedom when you can move away from that. There also is some risk. So now I have to be responsible for what I say and do and where I go. Um, where in the past, I let that responsibility be on the employer. They paid me every week. I got, you know, they had the health insurance. They had all of this stuff laid out for me. Uh, but when you go out on your own, you got to figure some things out and you got to be responsible for yourself. How? Which, let me tell you something, which led me to a debt-free life. 
when I left that job, I also learned to be debt free. So my condo is paid for, my car is paid for, I have no credit card debt, I have none of that stuff. So when I go on a trip, I pay for it with the money that I have, mm -hmm. and I don't create any bills around it. So the only bills I get are my monthly cable bill, you know, gasoline and food. So I would assume now, kind of thinking about this, these are the lessons that you kind of should have had in your teenage years that you had to have life kind of teach you along with those around you in terms of mentors and et cetera, Absolutely. right? And, but you know, you know, life is funny. In my teenage years, I was pressured to, what are you gonna do when you grow up? You know, like at 21, you had to know what you were gonna do and go for it. Mm. Well, I had no idea what I wanted to do until I was 30. And, and it, on some level, it's so unfair that people get put into a box that every kid needs to know what they're gonna do. Here's a question that I always have for people when you know we have these kind of uh, shifts in our careers, consciousness, whatever it might be. And when when did you uh, end up uh, deciding to like, kind of like take the reins of your uh, career? How long ago was that? Take the reins of my career? Well, I thought I was doing it um, when I got my second job in the field of addiction. Mm -hmm. I got certified through the state of New York. Mm -hmm. I was working for a therapeutic community. I asked for a raise and they told me, well, we weren't gonna give you a raise. I said, well, if that's the case, I just got certified. I'm now more educated than I used to be. I'm more skilled. So I took the reins and decided to get another job. So I moved into another job um, and became the program director at that job. I thought I was taken over then. When that job got old and I got tired of the man, so to speak, the boss, I got another job. I moved out to Texas. I didn't particularly like living in Texas. It was so hot. Um, and I stayed there for a year. And then I got this other job in Florida. So I moved to Florida. And that's when I had the, so I'm taking the reins. I'm getting another job. I'm getting paid more money. I'm doing more things. And I kept that job for 14 years. I wish I had, actually I kept the job for seven years. And then I resigned and I moved to Egypt and I lived there for a year. When things got rough for me over there, I decided to come back and go into the ease of that old job. Mm -hmm. You know, cause it was just easier to fit back in. They were gonna give me $10,000 more uh, per year. They were gonna pay for my uh, moving expenses to come back, so why not take it? And I spent another miserable six years with them. <laughs> and, um, and, you know, so here I am now. So at, at, at many points, yes. I thought I was taking the reins and I was moving towards something. So I don't discount that part of me because that's what I was doing. I was searching for something. Um, and now I'm closer to finding what I'm, I haven't gotten there yet. Um, there's a lot more things that I need to do. Um, I personally think I would do better with a bigger audience. You know, so I've worked with these smaller audiences and helped these smaller groups of people. Um, it feels like it's my time to have a bigger audience. You know, I'm gonna be the next Tony Robbins or Dr. Phil or something like that. Um, because I'm, I'm, actually I'm ready for it. It's not like, ooh, it's this- It's become normal. It, it, it becomes the norm for me. I just need a bigger, um, bigger auditorium. I, I speak in a small auditorium now. I just need bigger. Um, and I probably need some mentorship around that. But you know, one of the things that we didn't talk about is the athletics, right? Because when I think about recovery, my personal recovery, and I think about other people's recovery, physical fitness has to be a part of it. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants to be a sober old man who can't walk. Yes. You know, with a bad back and is so frail, no muscle tone, you know, that we need to recover physically and we need to also engage in practices that are consistent with our age or our development. So 
you know, sitting around reading books isn't going to help my muscle tone. Mm -hmm. So I have to go to places where I can get that done. I, I, I realize that some people can't do what other people can do, but you can swim, you can walk, you know. That's a great question as to, so a lot of people that you see who come into, um, you know, in, into recovery, they're so imbalanced at this point, right? Like their life is consumed usually by the addiction and, and whatever they need to do to fuel that addiction. In your experience and in your opinion, where do you think like getting these people eating right, sleeping better and exercising, how do you think that plays into the overall perception of the individual and their ability to actually stick to a routine that puts them in a position to, con to, to get some, some kind of semblance of control in their lives? Well, I think um, people do need direction in that. Mm -hmm. um, so if a person's in a treatment program, the treatment program really needs to take more responsibility in helping people with diet, not just giving them uh, grocery, um, grocery, money. grocery money. They buy their food and they cook their food. Yeah. Or it's one of those rehabs that cooks food for them and just fattens people up. Mm -hmm. um, so people need to understand how to eat and how food is fuel and how food can help them. They also need to learn how to exercise. So they give them a gym card and everybody goes and works from the chest up. And these are the guys with the long shorts because they don't want to show their skinny legs, right? Um, so uh, physical fitness is something to be learned. And most guys, so to speak, are cocky and arrogant and think that they know what they're doing and really don't know what they're doing. So they really need as professional help as they get with a psychiatrist, a psychologist, or an addiction counselor with physical fitness and nutrition. So, because when I see people who are, are constantly, chronically depressed, who are turning to addiction and that kind of stuff, you look at the rest of their lives and they're like, okay, so what do you do? Uh, I work like 10 hours a day. And then what do I do? Oh, and then I sit at home and watch Netflix and then whatever, I'll get high or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then it's just like, okay, so like- But even if you take the get high out of it, yeah, sitting that. home, yeah. looking at Netflix, smoking cigarettes, drinking coffee exactly. and ice cream is gonna cause depression. So like how much intervention do we really need in terms of, or, or how do you, not how much do we need, but how much of a factor is their lifestyle choices playing? Well, how much that you need is important. Mm -hmm. People need a whole lot. Yeah. So I mean, doctors and pilots with addiction problems, mm -hmm. Um, in order to continue on in their chosen profession, have to engage in a process for five years mm. bef you know, before it's complete. So they don't just you know, have an addiction problem, go to rehab for 30, 60, 90 days, and they're done. They have to engage in a process for five years of monitoring, a continuing care, urine testing, uh, mentorship, counseling for five years. And that's what changes social norms. So these quick fixes, 30, 60, 90 days treatment program, send them to AA is not enough. Mm. People need more. Now, is that a shift in uh, the recovery process? Because I, I really had never heard about that until we had spoke a little bit about it before in terms of long term recovery. Well, if listen, if it takes five miles to walk into the desert, it's going to take five miles to walk out, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so if I've been practicing addiction for 15 years, mm -hmm. you think a 30-day, 90-day <laughs> program is going to tap, you know, is going to really make that change? Oh, do your 30 days and then start going to some 12-step meeting? That's not enough. 12-step meetings are good. Diet and exercise, uh, coaching, uh, therapy psychiatric care if you need it. There's the whole list of things and it has to be long term for a person to change. It's not going to happen overnight, 30, 60, 90 days. It's not going to happen in a year. It needs to go past the year. It needs to, I would say at a minimum, three years. So what you're saying is that we're trying to basically remap the brain in terms of the way that you, um, your habits, the way that you cope with stimulus, uh, your relationships and how you practice relationships. So all those things basically need to be remapped in order for you 
to have some kind of semblance of, of a new life. Yeah, it needs to be remapped and the people around you need to be remapped too. Whether you're taking that So or you're... mom, dad, wife, husband, kids all need to be along in this three to five year process. Yeah. So let me ask you this, are there times where you don't have complete support from the family? Absolutely. There are some families that won't get involved, so you have to work with that too. Mm. Um, sometimes you work with people's chosen family. So maybe a friend mm. or, um, or maybe a non, you know, like a boyfriend or girlfriend will participate where mom and dad, brother, sister won't. Yeah. Um, how do you prevent people from exchanging one addiction for, to another? So that's... The, so this is where people get confused. Mm -hmm. Addiction is bigger than one substance. Mm -hmm. So if we talk about drugs and then separate that from alcohol and separate that from gambling and separate that from food, mm -hmm. we're not gonna win. Mm -hmm. So we need to talk about addiction as a it's whole. Like <laughs> yeah, yeah, addiction as a whole, not as a specific substance and then work on that, help people understand that. And oftentimes even rehabs don't talk about addiction as a whole, they talk about a particular substance. And so even when you get into, what is that, medically assisted therapies, mm -hmm. they're on some level dealing with a substance, opiates. Well, okay, so we got an opiate blocker. What about cocaine and gambling? You know, you know what? A, you, know. you plug one hole. Yeah. It's going to come out of the other. So, so what you're saying is we need to treat the underlying causes to addiction. Um, well, we need to treat addiction. Addiction, exactly. Yeah, as a whole. Okay, all right. And um, so, you know, it, it's interesting because we, you had spoke about like all the the determining kind of ideas around addiction and the things that you would experience of like, okay, I naturally gravitated toward these people. We thought this way. We acted this way, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, in my field, what I try to prevent people from doing, like, you know, we just talked about is, you know, exchanging one for the other. Because there are a lot of people who um, I do an encounter um, from, you know, recovery um, who are now seeing the feelings of my specific field, which is CrossFit, um, you know, and they go, ooh, I like this. And I have a lot of people who are around me who like this. You know, does that set them up for another kind of rabbit hole that they're walking down? Well, I, I, I don't, I don't know, you know, I guess there probably are some, but I think most people in something like CrossFit will figure out what their limits are mm -hmm. and, um, and then stick with that. You know, some of those people actually get hurt mm -hmm. before they get there. Mm -hmm. And that's what triggers, oh, I better slow down on this. You know, maybe doing... 30 inch box jumps isn't the best thing. Maybe I stick with 24 yeah. because I keep, you know, banging up my shit. That being said, you know, you've probably worked with tons of people who go, you know what, you know, I did this, you know, drug that much. Now I probably shouldn't do that again. And yet they'll continue to do it over and over again, you know? So, and so the intervention is, I think in a gym is the gym owner mm -hmm. says, you know, listen, we're going to need to restrict you. Yeah. Um, that you can't be on the treadmill uh, for three hours. Yeah. You know, it's, you know, we're liable. So yeah. somebody has to take responsibility. Absolutely. You know, you know, even if you're as the gym owner, you have to take care of yourself. You know, we can't have you dying in our gym. Absolutely. Um, so we're going to need to um, restrict you from that. So it becomes the community has to help. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's hard to do recovery alone. Yeah. It, it's a rec it's a community thing. So people at the gym start to notice, wow, this guy is just, you know, killing it, but it's going way too far. They got to tell maybe the manager and say, listen, yeah. you know, my buddy over here is, you know, and somebody has to sit down with him. Yeah. And at the very least, like you said, um, minimize the, uh, you know, risk involved in, on the behalf of the facility. Like, listen, you can do that. I mean, I, I get what you're doing, but we don't want to be the ones assuming risk in, in this. But it's the same like the guy that goes to AA and NA, you know, three times a day, um, seven days a week. That's 21 meetings a week. What else is going on in your life? Yeah. Now, there are some people based on their circumstance 
well, that probably is a good thing. Yeah. But if you have a family and you have a job and you have other responsibilities and, and you're, you're killing it that yeah. way, there needs to be some kind of balance. Yeah. yeah. And I, I imagine that's a fluctuating kind of deal in terms of determining what your balance is in that particular time. Because I imagine if you were doing crack three times a day and you go, okay, I'm going to start doing CrossFit and you do that twice a day, that might be a better balance in that well, moment, a better right? Balance, but it's impossible. I, I, I mean, I smoke crack mm -hmm. and I could smoke crack every day, all day for many days in a row. Mm -hmm. I can't do that with the gym. <laughs> Now, I mean, my, br you know, because it's that chemical in the brain yeah. that got, you know, it's the crack that led me to more crack. Yeah. The gym will not lead me. I will not be working out for six, seven hours a day, five days a week. Absolutely. But you probably have the ability to do a workout in the morning and then come back and do a workout in the evening. I certainly do. And I've done that before mm -hmm. that I would work out, weight train in the morning and I do cardio at night. And for me, that was balanced because it was balanced. I, and I didn't do it seven days a week. Yes. And you were able to decide of doing that. Like, oh, I have responsibilities of doing this. And you were yeah. able to do those things. Over time, it was like, eh, I don't know that I want to do this anymore. Yes. So, you know, sometimes it's a phase, you know, and, and you I need to walk down that yeah, path. And, and I got it out of my side. system. Yeah. And now I'm doing something else. So how do you, um, you know, uh, as a, uh, a coach, therapist, interventionist, how do you give the leash enough for them to learn the lesson or to explore that possibility without them going so far as to start to regress? Well, I mean, I think you have to reflect back to people um, and help them see what they're doing. Actually verbally say what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And you, you, know, you ask that question, well, how is that working? you know, was, and, and they'll let you know. And then you kind of help them because they're the ones that have to buy into it. Yes. So when they buy into it and start talking about, you know, this really isn't, well, what do you think would be helpful? Well, this, that, and the other. Well, what do you think gets in the way then of you doing X, Y, and Z? Well, this, that, and the other. Well, how can we reduce that as a problem? So starting to ask people powerful questions and letting them answer and um, come up with their own solutions. You know, they have to have their own goals. I can't give somebody a goal for them. I mean, there are some people who come to me that it's real clear, you need to go to the hospital. So I'll give them that direction. But somebody with some stabilization, I hopefully can help them to come up with their own solutions, you know, rather than me telling them what to do. Because nobody listens to advice anyway. Yeah, not nearly as powerful. And if it, it, if they're not willing to receive, mm -hmm. then they're not going to hear it. And you're just blowing smoke into the air. Yeah. Now, if you do come across a person and you are asking those questions and they come at you with denial, what is your uh, strategy? What's, what, what things do you go to to kind of uh, break down that wall or maybe even move around that wall? Well, I keep chipping away at it. Mm -hmm. And... Um, if they keep coming back, they're coming back for a reason. Mm -hmm. I mean, people don't have to come see me. Yeah. Um, and I might ask, you know, I, you know, we talk about these things. We talk about changes. You seem to not make the changes, but you come back every week. Mm -hmm. well, you know, why is that? Mm -hmm. You know, and, you know, they'll get in. Well, I think it's helpful, this, that, and the other. And there's sometimes that people are getting helped slowly that I don't realize it. Yeah. So if I ask those questions, they'll tell me how they're being helped. And then I might say, is there any other ways that I can be more helpful? With some people, I throw my hands up. I let them know, listen, it doesn't seem like I'm helpful. You know, maybe you would want to see somebody else. Mm -hmm. You know, I have a colleague or, or maybe you know somebody that can yeah. help you. And sometimes that's enough for them to, yeah, Michael's going to, give me up, so to speak. Yep. I, if I want to work with Michael, I may have to listen to some of the things that he says and maybe make some changes. And I, that's not a manipulation. I was going to say, um, yeah, because again, if I'm not effective, 
why, I'm not going to take your money every week. Yeah. You know, um, yeah. Was that always the case in terms of your ability to be like, listen, if I'm not helping, I don't want to, I don't want to be a part of this or, or I'm, I'm, if I'm not helpful, you should be going somewhere else. It, I mean, for me personally, sometimes I have an issue of like wanting to be the person who is able to help everybody. And if I'm not helping that person, then Oh shit. Right. So did you come to a point in your career where that was that like that, or is that inherently kind of who you are? Like, listen, I don't want to waste my time. Well, listen, when you work for an agency, you're forced to work with people mm -hmm. that may not be doing better, but you, so you have to work with them yeah. when you're working more independently, you can make some choices. Yep. Um, sometimes, I mean, these things really need to be thought through because is it about me or is it about the person? Sometimes I need to hang in there longer. Um, because there's something uh, that I'm ready to quit too soon and it's not going to help that person if I quit, you know, so I have to evaluate that. Usually I'll talk to some people, you know, I'm working with this person and this or that's happening, you know, and this is what I'm experiencing around them. And, you know, sometimes some of my peers can help me with that. Yeah. So that, that's actually a great place to kind of go with this is, um, do you, uh, how do you manage your own? biases, experiences, expectations of an individual versus what they're giving to you. Um, so obviously you see someone coming at you, you've been with them for six months, like you probably inherently say like, listen, this is where you should be and you're not there. And obviously I, you know, we all have frustrations. We all have like, listen, I've been telling this guy 15 times he should be doing X, Y, and Z still hasn't been doing it, but they say they're getting better. How do you manage that? as a uh, coach and an intervention? Well, oftentimes I don't know, but I, I'm working, I had worked with this celebrity and the ego was, I'm gonna work with this celebrity mm -hmm. and I'm gonna help this celebrity mm -hmm. and it's, it'll be somehow found out that I helped the celebrity and I'm gonna be this big shot. Mm -hmm. Within a very short period of time that I realized I couldn't help this person. And I was only compromising by working with them. So I had to let go and let somebody else. I even got to the point where I had to let go, let somebody else, and not give my opinion about this because it was biased. Um, once I kind of got myself together around it and got some perspective, I was able to give some input into what I thought might or might not be best for this person. Um, but one of the things that I've, I've learned is to say my piece once and I don't need to repeat it because anytime I repeat it, I'm trying to control the situation. Mm -hmm. So I kind of let that go. Um, and I also realized, you know, once again, um, how I can be enticed by money, mm -hmm. uh, the possibility of fame and things like that, and just to better manage that. You know, I've, I've been saying this for probably 10 years that I live my life as a millionaire and I don't need to compromise um, my value system because somebody's gonna give me something. I have everything that I need. Mm -hmm. I literally have everything that I need. I can go to the mall, and not want anything in the mall. So I've gotten to a place where the uh, I just can't be compromised mm. because um, I have everything that I need. So I just have to remember that um, and remember to manage the ego. Mm -hmm. You know. Um, Are there any practices that you use personally to um, you know to manage ego? I, I have a format that I use that I review, you know, every every year, mm -hmm. and I go through these these steps and and um, you know, kind of go through and relearn, and um, just keeps me. It keeps me focused, keeps me balanced, and every time I do them, I learn more. Every time I do them, I give more. I I you know, like I open up more, peel back the, um, the onion, so to speak, and slowly are getting to the core. Um, I think that I've moved towards um, this whole idea of self-actualization. Mm -hmm. 
you know, which it just has come upon me recently. And um, so that's a good place. Now my uh, beard of wisdom is actually, it's not, it's more than just a look. Yeah. You know, I am wise. Yeah. And so I, I kind of own that kind of stuff now rather than, um, than not own it. Yeah, not and, and and not in an egoic sense either. It's just an, an actualization. Like I yeah. know enough now yeah. to know what I know and know what I don't know, yeah. and know that I can uh, make a change if necessary, and not have my ego holding on to something that prevents me from making that change. But do you hold? Uh, you know, how do you overcome the uh, judgment and guilt based upon the things? You know, because it's very easy for us to go, oh, I didn't know that thing before time to beat myself up for it that I didn't know that I didn't know. Do you ever well, have that happen to you? Well, yeah, I beat myself up. I don't know that I beat myself up. There was a time when I'd say I beat myself up all the time. Mm -hmm. I don't beat myself up all the time, but I do beat myself up yep. um, for not knowing things yep. or things that I should have known or I could have done better. And what's the process once you have that awareness? What do you do from there? Well, I realized, well, I couldn't have known better because I didn't know. If I had known, I probably wouldn't have done it. Or if I was aware of what was blocking me, mm -hmm. I would have moved that block yep. and made the change. But at that point, I wasn't aware of it. Yeah. So at this point, using that awareness, you do the best to um, create a new um, practice mm -hmm. and try to adhere to that practice as best as possible. And when you fall off of it again... You go back to the beginning, you know, is that there, is there an idea of forgiveness in your practice? Absolutely. Um, because forgiveness isn't always for them. It's for me too. Mm -hmm. Boy, what a relief. When I forgive you, I'm relieved because I'm not holding on to that grudge, that resentment, that anger, mm -hmm. you know? So it's a, it, forgiveness is for me yeah. also. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, you know, kind of to, to, to bring this to a full kind of uh, conversation here, uh, you have had your own physical journey over the last, especially since, you know, you've been at our gym for the last 10 years now, you're very much a, a, a almost founding member at CrossFit Daria Beach. How has your physical journey been since you started versus where it is now? You said you, you know, you don't just have the beard now, you are the beard, so to speak. So what has that taught you in terms of your own physical transformation? Well, I mean, I mean, when I started CrossFit, I think I was physically, I couldn't do everything that was asked of me to do. So it was a process of getting stronger to be able to do it. Um, but once I had um, scraped up my shins a couple of times, I realized, you know, that 24 inch box jumps wasn't for me and step ups <laughs> were for me. And um, I didn't start in CrossFit until... I was, um, you know, way into my 40s. Mm -hmm. So um, I just had limits. And I had to realize that I'm not 35 years old. I'm not 40 years old. I'm 48. And, um, and I need to do some modification. You know, my, I've always had an athletic build. I've always been thinner. But one of the things that I've learned is I eat like a young man. And um, it's just kind of dressing like people who dress that are, aren't really dressing their age. You've got to start to grow up and dress your age. But I was eating like a young man. Mm. And um, in eating like a young man, I couldn't lose the weight that I kept gaining the weight. Mm -hmm. And so I'd keep going on these diets and workout things and lose the weight and gain it back. And then I realized over time that I was gaining more and losing less. Mm -hmm. And so I really needed to um, do something drastic um, around my diet and exercise. And so, you know, because I've tried everything, um, I had to use the ingredients of the everything that I've tried that's worked and put those together um, to be successful. So over this, I, I think in 2000, 16, I was around 240. Mm -hmm. 2017, I hovered between 240 and 250. And 2018, 
I got up to 280, mm. 285. That was way too close to 300 for me. <laughs> you know, I had went to the big tall man shop because none of my pants fit and they had a pair of pants with the stretchy thing on the sides oh, wow. and I went out and bought them um, and I tried them on when I got home and it was so humiliating and embarrassing that I went back to the store and I returned those pants and I dared them to ask me why I was returning. They didn't ask. Um, you think I'm going to be wearing stretchy pants? You know, um, so then I was bound to determine to make the changes. So, so I've taken off um, 55 pounds and I got another 30 to go. So I'm now down to 230 and I want to get down to 200. And everybody says to me, well, Michael, you're going to be so skinny. I'm a thin person. Yeah. In general, yeah. I just had a lot of fat around my bones. Yeah. So when I get down to 200, it's probably going to be more of a normal weight for a guy who's six foot one yeah. and my body type. Yeah. Um, 23 and me, I did the DNA testing mm -hmm. and um, they did the DNA and the health. And they said, with my DNA, I fit under um, the category of elite athlete. So I have the same DNA as an elite athlete. I just haven't been living like one. <laughs> um, so, so not that at 60 I could become an elite athlete. Maybe I could at this age, um, but I'm going to do my very best to get into the very best health I can be in order to just live a more happy, more productive, physically fit life. I think that's hugely inspiring. And I think that's also, uh, lends to an enormous amount of vulnerability, which I think people resonate with is the journey that you've kind of gone on physically over the last 10 years. And at this point, at your most advanced age, coming to the idea that like, yo, this is it. Well, you know, the truth is nobody, everyone prepares people for getting older, but nobody prepares people for getting old. Mm. So you're kind of, I'm kind of figuring this thing out at 60 on my own. And um, so there's been no rule book, book or how to do it or, you know, a it hasn't been yet, yeah, yeah. or support group <laughs> um, of people sitting around talking about how do we do this? You know, how do we get to this next phase in life? Yeah. And um, it's been trial and error. And I have met some people um, in their late 50s, 60s, and 70s who have really started to talk about um, the changes that they're going through at this phase of their life. Yeah, it's one of the nice things about technology is that we are able to so easily communicate in those, those ways and those fashions so that people can, in your situation, have mentors um, you know, all around the world, or you meet somebody at a, a seminar or a speaking engagement, you go, Oh, wow, what do you do? What do you do? And then all of a sudden you're emailing back and forth. So it becomes much more easy that way. Yeah. Um, so Michael, if, um, do you have anything coming up? You said you, you know, you're, you're doing some speaking engagements. You do, um, some radio work. You do a lot of, uh, of, of, of one-on-one -on -one coaching and intervention work. Um, do you have anything coming up uh, more in the near future that we can uh, reach, you know, to, to, to get some of the content and that kind of stuff? Um, actually, I mean, you can go to my website, mm -hmm. which is recoveryguide.net. Mm -hmm. um, I have some things on there. Um, I don't have any big plans of doing anything. Um, you know, with this podcast, who knows, I might get discovered and <laughs> yep. um, something big may happen as yeah. a result of that. I don't have a plan, but I certainly am open mm -hmm. to any possibilities of things coming into the future. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and the last thing for, for us uh, here is, um, you know, in, in, in bringing everything together, um, if you were to sit down with yourself, uh, who let's say it was 30 years ago, you know, what advice would you have give, give to your self when you were 20, 25 that, you know, now that would have helped that person then? Well, I, I think the, I think everything that's happened has led me to the person that I am today. And I am pretty much satisfied with that. So if I were to do any do-overs, 
it probably would be more around impulsively spending money mm-hmm. um, that I would have saved, I would have spent, but I would have also equally saved. Mm-hmm. So there was never a balance around that for me. It was spend, spend, spend. Um, and anything I saved, I spent. Um, so I could be in a better financial position right now, although I, I feel like I'm in a good one. That's the only thing I would have changed. Um, if I could have done one thing, the cigarette smoking, I don't see any benefit for that for me at all in life. So if anything that I could have removed from my life is cigarettes, you know, which is very separate from, from other areas of addiction, drugs, alcohol, but cigarettes are, are just a complete waste of, um, and just, offered nothing for me so spend less stop smoking cigarettes and in the long run you'll be a lot better off michael herbert thank you so much for being on the fitness wellness and longevity podcast i appreciate everything and guys um, i will be putting up the information to get in contact if necessary with michael and to get all of his uh, information online as well thank you very much michael have a great day thank you all right yeah